Hey everybody, this is the Sam Gagne edition of Scuttlepuck, and we've got a big show today. Um, on the show, we've got Director of Pro Scouting for the Montreal Canadiens, Eric Crawford. That'll be a fascinating discussion. Uh, and also, uh, I'm pretty pleased to uh, welcome aboard ProStockHockey.com. This is a website where if you play hockey and you want, uh, want the gear that the pros actually use, I'm not talking stuff that looks like uh, what they might use, this is sticks, pants, gloves, equipment that actually gets returned from uh, pro teams. It's all new. It's not used, but it's all uh, it's the actual stuff pro players use. So uh, check them out. They're www.prostockhockey.com, and uh, they've been generous enough to give all Scuttlepuckers a break. So if you use the promo code SCUTTLEPUCK, you'll get a 10% discount. So really encourage you to check them out. It's a, a great website and a really cool service. Um and now we'll get to uh, the show right after Guitar Lightning Lee and his Thunder Band sing Crawfish and Beer. Welcome to the Sam Gagne edition of Scuttlepuck, episode 189. And on the line, as always, we have Dale. What's going on, Dale? Uh, not too much, Mike. How are things with you? Uh, not too bad. Been an interesting weekend, but uh, I don't want to go into details, but just want to say give uh, thoughts and best wishes out to my old man, uh, John. Uh, keep uh, Stay strong, man, and I know we'll uh, we'll get through this through the weekend. We'll just yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see you at a B-Sens game soon. That's right. Um, and I went last night. And, and it, what was the result? Uh, they played good in the first period, but they didn't play good in the second and third. And when you don't play good in the majority of the time, you lose. Okay. Summed it up well. And But uh, they were up 2 nothing, lost 4-2, uh, I think it was. Jeez, uh, uh, they're and, just like the Oilers. They drive you crazy. There was yeah. and there was just this one split second of uh, of interest is when so it's the uh, the, <laughs> there was it's the a island. split second of interest in the game. Now there's a yeah. promotion for the it, team. It's when uh, uh, so they're Islanders farm team, right? Bridgeport Sound. Yeah. And anyway, it comes skates around and uh, guy you know in the warm up turns around number twenty five is Bailey. And I was thinking, what? And then, of course, it didn't take long. It was Casey Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> Not our good friend, Josh. That's right. Uh, but how was, speaking of Josh, how was Hosang? Um, he scored the first one. Um, he does act a little differently out there. Um, he doesn't wear 66. Really? Um, yeah. I was, that was one of my biggest things. I was noticing the numbers are all, yeah, they're all just right in order, all in the 20s and hmm. stuff. But, um, he's not that big comparable to the no. rest of the guys. Um, but I don't know what he ended up with with points, but he got the first one power play. Oh, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, Hey, did you check out in the intro there? I mentioned pro stock hockey and I just say, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to check out the website, but it's, uh, that's pretty cool. So scuttlepuckers should, uh, take advantage yeah. of that 10% discount. I like, I love, I don't know if you checked out, but the sticks. I did, like, actually, because you told sticks. me to. See the goofy curves? That, like, <laughs> I know you go to like sport check, and you look at the curves, and they're all fairly standard. And you know it's the the Crosby pattern, but you know it's not what Crosby uses. But the yeah. sticks they have are the actual sticks, right? And you see some of them are just weird. Like mm-hmm. they're, they're, like there's some that like just bend at the ankle. Like It's not an actual curve. It's just like an, a, a, a straight angle. <laughs> like it just – and yeah. uh, well, That would be pretty cool stuff. You look good, you play good. Yeah, look good, feel good, play good. And the prices are, are good. Like those sticks are three hundred dollar sticks and they're asking I saw as low as seventy nine ninety nine up to like a hundred and forty nine ninety nine. But um to get pro level sticks for that is actually pretty good. So yeah, people should check them out and just use the promo code Scuttlepuck and see how it goes. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Um hey, we got a big guest coming up. Um, yeah. Real excited. Exciting. Shortly, yeah, we're gonna have Eric Crawford, director of pro scouting for the Montreal Canadiens, on. So he's gonna we're gonna talk to him a little bit about the, what it's like to prep for the trade deadline and be in the room. Um, and then uh, he's he's been around a while, so hopefully we'll get some good stories out of him. 
Yeah. You didn't ask me about milestones, or is that what you're going to do now? No, that's, uh, yeah, we'll get to the, the, we'll get to the regular stuff, milestones, who's hot, who's not, and some news, and we might as well jump right into it then. Who, what are the milestones, Dale? A little, a little different, couple different ones this week, but uh, David Poyle won, won three, he's won 300, one, sorry, let me try this again. David Poyle <laughs> has won 1,320 games as a general manager which now makes him the all-time leader beating uh, moving ahead of um, Glenn Sather. Yes. But the, but the interesting one, I don't know if you caught this one though, is Dana Hines, who is equipment manager for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Okay. He just worked his 2000th professional hockey game. Wow. That's pretty cool. It was pretty cool. So they gave him a silver stick and then a bunch of stuff and uh, he uh, he started out working for the Johnstown Chiefs. Nice. That's where he got his because that's where he's from. That, he's actually from there, and he started working for them. And through his career, he's worked a couple of different places in the Detroit organization and Tampa Bay. One, he was down there for the Stanley Cup, and now he has he's been in Pittsburgh since um, since then. I guess he's got f- um, four cups in total, three with Pittsburgh and one with Tampa Bay. Wow, the stories he could tell. And and uh, so I just read the little story on him. They gave him a shirt and a silver stick and, and stuff. He said uh, he noted right there he's getting all these um, calls from people that he's met along the way, including uh, Carlton, uh, one of the Hanson brothers from way back in Johnstown days. And the other guy he said that meant a lot to him that called him, John Tortorella. Oh, wow. He nice. said all the respect in the world for that guy. He took time out of his day to call me. So you think of all the people that he has he has come across and been with, including players. He, he mentioned a bunch of others. I'm not saying it was just Tortorella, but he, he made note of that. So uh, maybe, he's, maybe he does have – maybe he has got two personalities. Yeah, you know, I've, uh, you probably listened to 31 Thoughts there with uh, the – forget his role but he's with uh columbus uh, i don't know if he's agm or anyway he helped so but he he had nothing but good things to say about yeah. tortorella too so yeah i think that could be the case um mm-hmm. and uh so coming up is that all the milestones um i mean there's some uh there's a guy um larson in edmonton that played like his 400th game um, <laughs> some guy <laughs> kessel kessel got 400 assists this week okay and um Ovechkin still chasing the 600 goals. Yeah, 598 with his 40th last night, huh? Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. that's about it for that. And they asked him about 40. He's like, yeah, 40 is good, but really I want 50. So <laughs> I don't play 40. Um, yeah, who's hot and who's not? Right now uh, in the East, you got Philadelphia at 7-1-2, and two, so they continue to be hot and and. I, you know, I'm taking full credit for Philadelphia's resurgence because I was on the Broad Street Bully podcast, which is a great show and everyone should listen. Um, mm-hmm. Earlier this year when they had gone like 10 games without a win, they're 5 and 5 I think. And I said, well, I think this pretty much guarantees they're going to get into the, the playoffs and stuff because last year they had the 10-game winning streak and then fell out. Um, so I'm, I, I believe their resurgence is entirely because of me. I think, you know, makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, yep. I would, uh, that's, that's clear deductive reasoning. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, correlation always means causation. Um, yeah. and in the West, and, but sorry. they lost last, they lost last night though, in a shootout to the Tampa Bay lightning. Yeah. Well, it's a good team, which good is team. a good team to lose to in a shootout. Yeah. So then, uh, who else is hot in the West? Nashville continue to roll at eight, two and O, but what was really surprising to me, not quite as hot as uh, Nashville, but Arizona is seven, two and one <laughs> in their last 10. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, I would uh, look out Vancouver. They might just get look at Edmonton. Hell, Edmonton's so freaking bad lately. They, anything could happen there. Uh, I'm sorry. But they um, played last night. I know. Uh, McDavid got two points. I mean, that's really all that matters. They couldn't beat freaking eighth place New York Rangers, but uh, hey, that's mm-hmm. okay. Oh, Shirelli's he's got to go um in and then who's not hot besides the edmonton oilers in the east the new york islanders continue to struggle you know they look so strong for a bit there but they're uh they're down in seventh and they are two six and two in their last 10 and and just the the wheels seem to be falling off Mm -mm -mm. 
And, and in the West, a similar story for a team that, you know, we're, everyone's ex- kind of expecting to be there or we're looking strong. St. Louis Blues, 2-6-2, two, and two, and seem to have lost their ways. And after the trade deadline and moving Stashny out, I think, uh, yeah, definitely not looking good in St. Louis. Mm. The whole mood there, those guys couldn't even put on a brave face when he uh, when Stastny left and they were talking to him. Yeah, yeah. Like, and Shen even... was like, Oh boy. Yeah, not a happy camper. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting why they did that. Well, I, I mean, I get it. I mean, are they going to be a contender? No, he's a valuable asset. I mean, you look at what they got for him, and we can we can talk about that for a second. I mean, it's a great trade for the Jets going into the playoffs. Oh, for sure. Yep. But they got a a first and a fourth. So some some and Eric Foley, who I don't know a lot about, so I don't know what kind of a prospect he is, but. I mean, I, it does send a bad message to the dressing room. It's a bad message. Yeah. Like those, but uh, this... you got a decent team. There's the guys that got you to them. Like you know, they they talk about, um, you know, uh, what the GM should do to reward a team that's playing well or that's done well. You know, and here it is. They didn't. He didn't reward them in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, but maybe they didn't. But he did it. next year. Well, they're not playing maybe. well. So, I mean, I, I get it. I, you want, but at the same time, you have to be. You have to be pragmatic too. At some point, you you know, like you got to say, "I got an asset here. I can't just let it walk away because I'm mm-hmm. hoping against hope. I'm being naive, almost, right? Like, so it, that's a really, really tough decision. Like, when do you? Yeah, because nobody wants to just keep things to say. They got to just keep going and changing and future and stuff but anyway another reason why i'm not a gm in the nhl oh yeah tough decisions to make but in in other news uh taylor hall has gone to 24 (laughs) games with a point um and just putting a laser focus on on peter shirelli right now and uh and justifiably so um Mm -hmm. that's no that's a it's a good story there wow he uh uh, he's done wonders for that team like I even heard his name in the Hart Trophy discussion with somebody. I oh, absolutely. And I think you yeah. can make a legitimate case for yeah. him. I mean, he's most valuable to his team, uh, very much so. And and to the mm-hmm. point where Larry Brooks from New York is now taking cheap shots at Shirelli uh, this morning. I saw he said there's, there's an accepted theory that a team can only come up with a franchise player by bottoming out and cashing in at the draft. It doesn't hold up if you can get Edmonton Peter GM to trade with you, <laughs> Peter Shirelli to trade with you. <laughs> And he also said, Shirley, of course, also traded 21-year-old Tyler Sagan, so perhaps there's hope Leon Dreisettle will land on Broadway before he turns 23 in late October. <laughs> like, as an Oilers fan, that just cuts so deep. But he's right. Like, it's like, yeah, no, how, how does facts. Bob Nicholson keep that guy employed in Edmonton? I have no idea. Now, I mean, it's it's easy to pile on now because uh, Hall's doing well. Mm-hmm. Uh, because Hall's doing well now, it doesn't make that trade any worse than it was. It was bad from day one. Anybody who looked at it objectively said that's a bad trade. Like, I mean, right. people can say, oh, well, you know, Larson was good last year, and he was, but I can't mm-hmm. imagine anybody said that was value. And it's just, it's now, it's just completely blowing up. But I, I am hopeful that it, it's blowing up enough that just to save face, the franchise is going to say, you're gone. Like, yeah, you gotta, hey, you know what? We'll make you of we'll make you president of hockey ops, but we're going to put an actual competent GM in that's going to make these decisions because you're terrible. <laughs> so, uh, okay, move on. Leave yeah, yeah let's move it because I'll just keep going. Um, the Leafs uh, got blown out by Washington last night in um, probably possibly the ugliest uniform matchup. Uh, I don't know if all time, but it, it was ugly. Yeah, I didn't uh, actually see any of it. I am, but I listened to Babcock afterwards, and I really think that that should just be um, all his, uh, his his post-game interviews should just be recorded and just played in a continuous loop because it's just the same. Every <laughs> yeah, well, I thought, uh, you know, they, yeah. uh, they outworked didn't us. And we didn't look good. Um, they look like a bunch of kids out there playing against Washington. Yep. Um, uh. Yeah, we didn't get prepared. We didn't do this. I thought that, uh, we, you know, we're at the highest level. We deserve, We need to be prepared to the highest level. We weren't, so... <laughs> we're we're practicing tomorrow because we need to practice and uh, we'll go over things. Work and... boots on and get to work. <laughs> How it goes? Um, who does who uh, who does his uh, um, impersonation the best? Who's the guy? Dangle the does a pretty Dangle. good one. Yeah, Dangle. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Um, but uh, there's some, some good ones there. I, I don't know. I just, I don't know how they looked as bad as I thought they would look on the ice there. So um, I think, uh, I don't know. And just, I like their sweaters, but the, the, the white pants and stuff looked so stupid. It just looked really, and the, the, I made a comment last night is that the capitals are lucky because theirs were terrible too, but no one's talking to them because the Leafs were just so freaking bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, other right. than that, uh, you know what? I think, uh, we, let's uh, try and get, see if we can get Mr. Crawford in here. Okay. Yep. And now with us on the line, Hey, we are pleased to welcome director of pro scouting for the Montreal Canadiens, Eric Crawford. How's it going today, Eric? Good guys. Uh, I'm excited to get, get on the uh, program and I'm enjoying, uh, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Okay. Thanks. Right, it's a pleasure. Uh, pleasure to have you. Hey, hey, Eric, I know, uh, Scuttle puckers, as we like to call them, listeners, and uh, I and myself, I'm quite curious. What's it like uh, to be in the war room for trade deadline day? Day it just passed. It's got to be pretty intense sometimes. Yeah, it uh, it certainly can be. It can be uh, the most exhilarating experience. Uh, you know, when it gets down to the wire, particularly when you're when you're buying. Um, but it, it's completely dependent and relative on the situation. And there's there's a tremendous amount of time and preparation that goes into uh, getting ready for a draft or a trade deadline or a July 1st scenario. And we do gather in the in the war room and in all those occasions. And there are moments of uh, real intense scenarios that happen that uh, sometimes come to fruition and sometimes don't. Uh, but it it's certainly when you're you know we all play the game or most of the guys that work at the professional level played or coached or managed at, at some level and that's the one uh, period of time other than when your team is playing that you really feel that uh, that butterfly that really you know sort of intense feeling that can can take over um, because you you're recognizing that you're shaping. Uh, you know, the fortunes of your franchise and, you know, you have your fan base to consider, you have your ownership to consider and, and, the, and the people that you work with. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility. Um, and when <clears throat> decisions are made, um, you know, they can be, uh, they can be, you know, franchise altering, you know, and, um, you know, I can think of a few times over the years where, where it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, you've done a tremendous amount of preparation going into um, the scenarios, trade deadline or draft or, or July 1st scenario. And, you know, things invariably happen right at the end because, uh, you know, a lot of times it takes it takes a bunch of things to get a deal to happen. And I can remember in 2011 when I was working in Vancouver, I worked in Vancouver for 16 years, um, uh, we were preparing for the playoffs and we had a good team that year. As you know, we lost in game seven of the Stanley Cup Finals that year, and we were in the in the war room, and we had missed out on some players um, that we had been tracking, and our GM at the time, Mike Gillis, had been working on deals for <clears throat> more or less A players that we were trying to acquire uh, for the playoff run. And then, you know, so we're down into B and C options uh, for these deals that we're trying to make, and it's in the last five minutes. And I can remember we made two trades, in the last five minutes of the trade deadline in 2011, and they ended up being essential picks for us that uh, um, played big parts. And we picked up Max Lapierre, and we picked we picked up Chris Higgins both in the last you know, five or ten minutes uh, of that trade deadline. And there was conversation uh, leading up to uh, those moves, but they were executed uh, with the clock ticking and at that time there you know you still had to send a fact now that they've, <laughs> they've updated it and uh you know so you're in the queue and you have to make sure that it's time coded that your fax was sent uh, in that time period <laughs> and there's, there's some pretty stressful moments you know for the support people the uh the uh, uh, hockey assistants and things like that that uh, that do the administration aspects of it that you know they were they were feeling very nervous about uh, making sure that those things get executed. Yeah. Oh, I can just imagine how. Uh, yeah, a, yeah, a fax doesn't get through. That's going to piss some people off. No. Yeah, and there, believe me, there have been there have been deals that have been quashed, and there have been, um, you know, I can think of in Chicago a few years back uh, when they uh, neglected to um, to get their. Uh, 
the deals for uh, some restricted free agents that they had, you know, uh, through to central registry in time. And those players, um, uh, free agent status changed. And, you know, those, those things are, they're clerical errors, but <laughs> they're massive mistakes that can happen in organizations that, uh, you know, that, you know, for the most part can, uh, can negatively affect your team if you're not prepared correctly for them. Yeah. So now in, in the, in the room on, on deadline, I'm curious, like there's so much info yeah. going on. Are you guys watching like TSN? Are you watching the trade show to, to see what's going on around the league? Uh, yeah. Occasionally we will have it on sound off and, you know, we're just uh, tracking to see what's going on. But in general, our, you know, our, our manager and assistant managers are talking to the other 30 member teams manager so we have a good indication of of what's out there occasionally you're surprised by a deal that happens but for the most part um you 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 know in the preparation that we do we kind of make sure that uh, we know what every organization or we try to know what every organization's next move is going to be and sometimes we're successful but you know uh, some you know there are occasions where we are surprised by you know, a move that happens, and 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 ultimately, you know, those those things are proprietary. And some some teams, you know, they know something about an injury or a you know uh, a uh, conflict that might be happening in, in the dressing room with a coach or a player or a player versus player or something like that that will affect uh, a deal that you know that the average fan or even people like myself that it's, their job is to get intel and to and to know the you know ins and outs of, of every organization you know sometimes you are you are surprised but for the most part it there there's a playbook that you, you can see developing right wow. yeah. oh those are those are uh i don't know i i just envision i'm just seeing what that would be like and getting kind of excited um <laughs> yeah Anyway, there is a lot of get... there is a lot of sitting around as well because yeah. you know we're in there two or three days before and we've we prepared for this by doing essentially a mock scenario of, of mm-hmm. different things that we're trying to do and running uh, our managers running things up the flagpole versus uh, with other organizations. So we do have a kind of I- rough idea of, of, of where things are at. And obviously there's some posturing and, and, mm-hmm. and things, market conditions that change daily, you know, with playoff mm-hmm. positioning and injuries mm-hmm. and things like that, that, that change your, your decision-making at times. Mm-hmm. So, you know, speaking on the the exciting side and, and the um, that, so the Habs got ten picks this year, right? So yeah. is that that? So that must be. Have you ever had ten in a year before? Like, is this not just like the best kind of year for a guy like you? Well, it, it isn't the best kind of year because our team's out of the playoffs. So that's that well, ultimately so... you don't last too long when your team's not uh, in the position that we are for extended periods of time. But that out of the, that said, uh, that uh, to have a year uh, when you're running an amateur scouting staff like Trevor Timmons is doing with our with our franchise, and I've I've done that before uh, in my time in Vancouver. To have that currency going into a draft, uh, that amount of picks, and particularly where we have them, uh, we've got a first, we've got four seconds, and we've got some uh, fourth and uh, fifth round picks that may end up getting into the fourth that are in the, that range, you know, where. Um, most teams have have done a an analysis of, of you know drafts in the last ten years and where players that have played a hundred games or three hundred games or whatever where they generally are picked and where they where they sort of uh, uh, are acquired, acquired yeah. and yeah and you know having the, that number of picks in the heart of the draft is you know it's, it's advantageous obviously just just uh, because you're you're getting multiple picks where those players that tend to ha- on average have a have a better chance of of having prolonged careers are generally picked so that that puts us into a real good situation to be successful so mm-hmm. that's yeah. uh, exciting for franchise particularly now where w- w- how teams are built uh and you know with with the uh restrictions with 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 uh, contracts and, and cap situations um that you know your team really does uh, have to be homegrown and 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 built through the draft and developed through your through your system. So, it's uh, it's an exciting period for us. You know, there's 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 lumps that happen. This wasn't uh, hmm. uh, 
uh, we hope it's a more of a market correction, let's say, than than a than something that's going to be a, a long term thing. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. speaking of this week, uh, Elliot Friedman was on his Thirty One Thoughts podcast, and, and he, right. I know he's been in the news about saying that Vancouver fans and media kind of have an edge to them that, uh, and the only other market. He said that might be tougher. It would be Montreal, and, and you've got the unique situation of having worked for for both franchises. So, it, is is it true they're the toughest markets? And and you got any just examples or kind of stories to indicate just how tough it can be? Yeah, I I, I, I really do uh, feel that that is he's he's spot on. I believe in his, his assessment there. Uh, you know, any Canadian market is tough. But Vancouver in particular, um, because they haven't won, um, I think that there's, you know, and it's 47 years that they've had the franchise uh, this year, 47, uh, going on 48 years, and they they haven't won, you know. And in the 16 years that I worked there, um, they had been to the finals in 1994. I started working there in 1999. Uh, and in the, you know, in the, in the 16 years that I was there, we had 900 point seasons. So there was the whole West Coast Express era that we had there, and then we had the Sedin, Luongo, Kessler group that that uh, had the the run in 2011 and lost in Game Seven. So, uh, but prior to that, I think that there's the underlying thing with the older uh, fan base is that. You know, in from 1970 to 1994, they they I believe had less than 10 uh, teams that were above 500. So they had a franchise that wasn't particularly successful, and they weren't really close to winning. They had the Cinderella team in '82, which my brother played on, um, that went to the finals against the Islanders and 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 lost in 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 four games. Uh, but other than that, they really hadn't tasted a lot of success. And then the 90s came along, and they were uh, they were very successful, obviously, in 94, losing to the Rangers in Game 7. Uh, you know, Nathan Lafayette hits the player post away from, from, from winning the Stanley Cup. And, you know, that creates an anticipation, I think, in your fan base that um, really – it, you know, creates a, almost an, a hysteria, you know, and mm-hmm. they bottomed out. Uh, and then, you know, our group came in there. I, I worked with both uh, Brian Burke and Dave Nonis. And, and then uh, secondly, with Mike Gillis uh, in their managerial regimes in that time period. And, and like I said, we had 900 point seasons. They could, the fan base could see a young team building. Uh, and, you know, in the West Coast Express era, we, you know, our, our ultimate playoff success never materialized uh, for you know a variety of reasons, but it, it didn't it didn't happen. And then uh, you know the build began uh, uh, you know uh, in kind of a reset fashion with the uh, Luongo trade and and the uh, and the Sedins maturing into the franchise player those players that uh, they have become in Vancouver. And then uh, and then you lose in Game Seven. Uh, again, in, in Boston, and you know, it was a tremendous accomplishment. But again, the fan base is, is, you know, they're so close, they can feel it, and then they kind of get the the rug pulled out from under them again. So that, and you know, they, and what's happened since then uh, is that you know, they're it looks like they're finally getting their heads wrapped around the fact that they're rebuilding, and so the fan base is is eager to, to. <laughs> see who those next players are that we are going to get behind and and you know uh cheer on to to that next great Canuck franchise team and whether or not that'll happen who knows but uh that's 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 what it's like there and so there has been some some negativity early on because they weren't successful and then because they had some success there's an anticipation and then there's no ultimate cup release that happens, you know? So it, uh, I can understand the, the frustration. And I think in Montreal, I'll keep it short with Montreal, but they've won 24 cups in the most storied franchise uh, in, in professional sport. And it is a, it is a fan base that is extremely well-educated. You have two languages. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a standard of excellence there that the, the fans and the media n- know because they've been there and they've seen it and they've seen greatness and they know when 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 you're when the fan base is getting BS and they call you on it <laughs> and you know at sometimes at sometimes it's uh you know it's it's right 
and sometimes it's not respectful of the process um, that needs to happen to in order to be successful. But in general, I will say that yes, indeed, without question, they are the the two two toughest uh, markets in the NHL. You know, Toronto. Toronto's a bit different uh, because they, you know, it's, they've been 67 since they won, and the fan base there, I just, you know, they went through, you know, kind of a, a, a kind of a laughing stock of a franchise in the 80s, uh, and then they, you know, they had the good teams with Gilmore and that in the 90s where there was an anticipation, but they never got to the finals. They never got to that next step. And then that they've been tripping over themselves for the better part of a, a, a of you know two decades, and then finally now they've they, they've got a, a path towards success. And so we'll see if uh, the lovable losers in in uh, in Toronto, uh, if the fan base will get behind that, or whether they'll start to have a little bit more intensity that uh, that the marketplace I think can bear. Obviously with. Uh, with the standard of excellence that was there in the, in, you know, in the fifties and sixties with that proud organization. Yeah. Mm. So go ahead there, Dale. No, I'm, uh, I'm listening here, but I mean, when you, um, um, like when you're, you're scouting, so you do how many, how many nights a, a year are you scouting? Like you're actually in rinks looking and when you go to scout, do you, mm-hmm. is it just the games or do you try and scout practices and as much as you can? Yeah, like live live views, uh, you know, with 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 multimedia and stuff like that. I can I can you know, easily double the views that I have with with video, and and we have uh, you know an analytics company and, and a and a video company that that works uh, alongside with them that that will cut down shifts of, and we have it immediate. Like if I want to, mm-hmm. if a player that we're talking about is is uh, under consideration, I can watch all of the shifts from the last ten games, and I can do it in you know, at home in, you know, a few hours and, but nothing beats live views. And, but in terms of live views, yeah, I'm uh, a lot of nights. Uh, I don't want to put a number on it because it, 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 it changes, but I'm going to say minimum 150 games a year live and probably closer to, to 200 when you add in tournaments and, and uh, you know, world juniors and under 18s and, and mm-hmm. world championships and all those types of things where you, where your game count kind of kind of gives like a uh, odometer that that just keeps rolling you know <laughs> um but from 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 night to night yeah you're i'm in a rink most nights I, as as mike knows i play pickup hockey with a group of guys at home here on monday nights when i can because i coach my daughters prior to that and uh that's about the only day during the week that i have off and i'm and i'm only there probably 60 percent of the time so it's uh mm. it's a 24 7 uh commitment and, but i'm not complaining i watch hockey for a living so I, i'm not splitting the atom yeah. <laughs> some days it must feel like it though i'm sure <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. The, um, now i recently kind of a, a left turn here but i recently read uh the crazy game by clint malarchuk i don't know if you've read the book but it's a it's a fascinating story um yeah. what that guy went through um, but one thing I, I guess I wasn't expecting, but I was really impressed with was um, a that Clint Larchuk was like one of the toughest guys probably in the league. But he was super like wasn't afraid of anybody, would fight anybody at any time. But he was had yeah. such respect and loyalty to to Rick Dudley, uh, who he said was just a fitness fanatic and the toughest guy I think he'd ever met. Now I, I know you you work with Rick for Montreal. Yeah. What's Rick like, and and does that ring true to you uh, from from what Clint had said in the book? You know, I think that's an accurate de- depiction of of uh, Rick and who, whom we all call uh, in our organization and, and more and more broadly in, in the industry as Duds. He's just known as Duds, and uh, he's kind of a omnipresent guy. You know, you'll be in a game somewhere in the middle of nowhere and turn around hey Duds is here you know it's it's uh and he drives everywhere he doesn't he doesn't rely on too many other modes of transportation (laughs) uh he is you know constantly behind the wheel and and loves it but a couple funny stories about Duds is uh, uh, what you guys might not know is he's from our area he's from Brighton uh he's from uh, just up the road uh yeah uh by the big apple there and uh a funny story about him is he was drafted he was, you know, he was a football player. His brother played, uh, I believe, semi-professional football and, and uh, you know, played at the collegiate level. 
And uh, Rick was kind of following his footsteps, was big into football, big into lacrosse, and hockey was kind of like a passion of his, but wasn't really something. It was kind of a second or third sport for him. Uh, and he was playing in the Brighton, get this one, he was playing the Brighton Industrial League <laughs> as a as a 17-year-old and was, uh, you know, some guy tipped off, some scout uh, from the OHA's uh, St. Catharines, uh, I think they were the Blackhawks at that time, yep. that, you know, he should come down and watch this guy in the Brighton Industrial League, which uh, I can't imagine was the highest caliber of hockey, but... Anyways, Rick Dudley was drafted out of there to play in the uh, uh, prior to the OHL, the OHA with uh, with St. Catharines, uh, and you know basically fought his way uh, onto the team, fought his way into uh, professional hockey, fought his way uh, uh, into the NHL, and you know obviously had a couple of sojourns into the World Hockey Association, then back into the NHL, and made a, a real strong career for himself as a player, not just a tough guy. Like he was a 30 goal scorer. And was a guy that uh, that did it the hard way, and he, you know he he uh, approaches his life and his uh, and and his work the same way. You know, I remember when I was starting in the in the on the scouting side of things, leaving the coaching side of things, and and, and getting on this side of it. Uh, a pattern that I've always followed was, well, who's the hardest worker, uh, and whatever you know, whether it was when I was playing, when I was coaching, whatever, who's the hardest uh, worker, but. And without question, when I would poll people, when I got into scouting, well, who's the hardest working guy out there? And Rick Dudley invariably was the answer. Uh, and so, you know, quietly, I didn't really know the guy that well, but you should kind of watch him. You're seeing him all over the place and very meticulous in how he approaches things. And, and uh, you know, I and prior to that time, I wasn't working with him. I didn't work with him until I went to Montreal three years ago, and I've worked in the industry for, you know, 20 years now. And, uh but it was somebody that I always, from afar, uh, you know, respected uh, because of, of of how hard he worked and how how diligent uh, he took the profession and and how uh, and 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 how to your point, how loyal he was. Anybody that kind of knows Rick, he's managed in a few different places, and there's a group of people that tend to follow him around, and those are people that that he you know uh, has taken under his wing and and, and has taught. Uh, you know uh, his his uh, his philosophies too, and he's been very loyal to those people. And you know Clint obviously is one of them. He's had Clint uh, as a teammate. He had him as a as a goalie coach. And you know with with Clint's struggle with mental health, and you know his uh, a few situations that happened, as you can reference in the book. Uh, you know Rick really helped him through a lot of those situations and was a was a you know a great friend and and mentor and you know just uh someone that that can save a life you know and uh that uh, that type of loyalty you know isn't something that uh that you see often and you know it's certainly admirable and uh and commendable for, for sure but uh yeah from the from the humble beginnings of the Brighton Industrial League who knew yeah <laughs> Maybe There's you need so... to expand your scouting, eh? Get into the uh, the old Tuesday yeah. night league here in Belleville or something. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And talking about working out, Duds is uh, you know he's he's he he won't admit it, but he's you know he's over sixty now, and uh, he is the he is the fittest uh, over sixty year old uh, gentleman in the industry. He's he's got uh, Hulk Hogan twenty four inch pythons, and and <laughs> it's funny the first time I ever approached him. Uh, was I was I was scouting a game and it was in the first couple of weeks that I was working on in scouting and I left coaching and, and went on this side of it and I was in New Jersey and I was staying at a kind of a second rate hotel uh, off of where the old Brendan Bernardini used to be and uh, or the Meadowlands sorry and um, so I'm going in there to to work uh, you know to check into this hotel and I see Rick Dudley's getting out of his car. And he's struggling with with something. So I go, oh, hey, can I give you a hand? And he goes, yeah, sure. You know, he goes, oh yeah, I saw you the other night, kind of thing. And and he had two fifty pound barbells or dumbbells and a weight bench. And I go, what what's this all doing? So, oh, the gym's uh, the, the gym's no good in this place. He used a term that's in the vernacular, but it's uh, <laughs> he goes, this gym this this gym's no good. And I said, okay, I guess guy's serious about working out. He's bringing his own gym with him in his car. <laughs> but but that's uh, that's Duds in a nutshell. Yeah. Oh. Interesting guy. That's great stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, one thing, and uh, I know you got you're busy. You're probably uh, touring kids all around the, the city from rink to rink or something. But uh, uh, last one for me, I wanted to know any. Can you tell us any either big trades or draft picks that almost happened that didn't? That would be uh, mm. interesting. Yeah, the uh, I don't like to get into those too much okay, because okay. Uh, obviously they uh, no no I'm, I'm good to talk about it but it's just you know it, they meet they they leave a, a a sour taste in your mouth but the the one thing that that I can say in, in those scenarios uh, you know having worked in it uh, for a long time now you know you, there's a lot of talk that happens that going into a trade do you like this guy you know let's do our numbers set, study on him let's make sure we've got some uh you know intense views on on him against tough competition let's make sure that you know we're talking to his former coaches let's like we're we're doing our intel in those situations um and then you know then there's the second part of the deal where there's the interchange that happens between managers you know working around uh getting the parameters of deals done and the one thing that i have learned uh over all of the years is not to get excited because until that conversation happens uh, where it's, do we have a deal? Uh, there's lots of times where, you know, we were talking about, would you do this? I'm not saying I would do this, but if you, if, would you consider this? And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, buzzwords that are used that, that you, you kind of know when a deal is close to getting done. It's no different than in real estate or in a stock trade or whatever that, that, uh, those words are happening, but until that handshake is uh, is is completed and those uh, contracts are signed and it and it's approved by Central Registry, uh, it's not a deal. And I've had uh, you know a few big things <laughs> that, that could have happened over the years that didn't. Uh, but you can't lament uh, you can't lament uh, those situations. You just have to recognize that until uh, the deal is done, it you know it's not a deal. Uh, I, I will tell you the one deal that really surprised me the most, or well, where I where we were not unprepared for it, was uh, when I was in Vancouver. It was the draft was was in Vancouver. It was when we made the Roberto Luongo trade, and you know we had heard some rumblings of of uh, you know that that uh, Roberto and uh, Mike Keenan was the general manager there at that time. we were, were having some conflict and and whatnot but uh, i can remember when that trade was executed it took a very short period of time for us to say yes it was yeah okay yeah you're gonna we're gonna move these pieces and you know we would at the end of the day it was roberto luongo and we just looked at each other start the car let's go uh <laughs> and you get that fax in at that time it's still faxes to central registry and and you know it was a it was a great trade for us and uh and you know it set us up uh, for a fair amount of success in our time in in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, and certainly, in 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 any scout will tell you uh, to answer your question about draft picks. Uh, any scout will tell you that they've had misses where they were certain on players um, that you know had had uh, had talent to play. Um, at the national league level. And the one thing that I can say that you cannot put your finger on that, uh, fans and media and people outside of the, of, uh, of the industry tend to not pay enough attention to is the human element. Uh, I, I can, I can think of a, a number of situations where there were players that couldn't handle certain marketplaces or couldn't handle certain, certain situations or couldn't handle, uh, certain coaches and that's something that you can't put your finger on that is the human element that that often goes uh, unreported and and often goes underappreciated uh, in scenarios like that and you, you can you can you can have a player and and they can have all of the talent in the world all the all of the uh, resources to be successful and for whatever reason it doesn't happen and you know it's uh it's not a character thing it's it's not a it, it's just it's a human thing that you can't put your finger on but you you uh you you have to be respectful of it um and it's uh, it's it's one one sort of thing that uh oftentimes in in my mind gets gets overlooked um in the in the uh you know frenzy of 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 trade and trade talk and and uh 
all those all those kind of things, you know. Yeah. I, I certainly know that guys that play for one organization and then they go to another, I know for certain that there is a period where they're that where it takes them to to figure it out because they've they've been so used to doing things one way and then everything's changed and now they're with a, a new team and there's uh you know and that's the human element that I'm speaking of that yeah. you know oftentimes you you uh is uh under underrepresented let's say yeah that's a great point yeah. i can see how uh you know like as fans they're just they're just uh they're items on the tv they're just they're commodities right and you just say well just they they are this way every day, but you forget, you know, they've, they've got lives outside of hockey and that can affect their game. That's a, that's really fascinating insight. Dale, you got any last one for Eric before we let him go? No, I was, no, I, we probably should let him go. I just like to talk about the human element over a beer sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, as Mike will tell you on Monday nights, I've been known to have a couple of, uh, drafts before, uh, or sorry, after hockey, not before. That affects my that affects my game negatively if I have them before. <laughs> Anyways, a pleasure, a pleasure listening to you, and uh, thanks for uh, coming on with us. Okay, cheers, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Yeah, bye bye. Okay, wow, that's some fascinating stuff. I know. I, I want <laughs> as much as I wanted to ask him more questions. I'm thinking, oh man, we can't keep him here all day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could. <laughs> I know he's. Uh, wow. I, I love to hear that. And I uh, couldn't. Uh, you know, and I. The other part, it couldn't help my hand. Does they sound the same? I can't believe how much he sounds like Mark. Mark and oh. oh, yeah, it's crazy. Like I know. I was thinking as soon as you got on the line, and I mean, I I, I see him every Monday, right? But uh, on the phone, even you're just like, holy cow, does mm. he ever sound like Mark? <laughs> Yeah. And I don't know. I don't think I ever have met him. I think we've been, I've been at Oliver's when he's been there and stuff, but I don't think I've ever met him. Yeah. Well, now you have. Mm. Yeah. Now I have. Great guy. And that was a, a fascinating, <laughs> uh, fascinating interview. And hopefully I'm sure Scuttlepuckers will enjoy that. Um, where were we on our, on our agenda here? We got through the news, I guess. Um, and I get, no, I guess we'll, f- do you want to talk at all about the trade deadline? I mean, everyone's gone over it a million times. I think yeah. the only things uh-huh. that were interesting to me were the the Paul Stastny surprise trade. I think that was the biggest I, surprise of the day. I think it was, and I think the um, I think the other kind of uh, over over lying thing now is that the big ones are getting done beforehand, right? Nobody's waiting till the last. Uh, the last day and so the rick nash deals which was going to be the biggest one of the day it already happened before so yeah absolutely i know that must drive tsn and sportsnet crazy right yeah yeah oh, yeah they're like oh could you just wait could you just wait but anyway yeah. um so here i do have one question for you you because you would know stuff like this you any two, two teams can trade at any time. Two teams could trade today if they wanted to. Other than those people, those guys would not be eligible for the playoffs on the roster of that team. Correct? I believe that's correct. Yep. So two teams that are not in the playoffs can trade away at any time. Yeah, like I mean, two teams could trade now. The player, but I believe the player yeah. just can't play in the playoffs. So if you're in the playoffs, why would you do it, right? But like a team like Edmonton could trade Ryan Nugent Hopkins for a fucking bag of pucks and it would be yeah, okay. And somebody, and somebody might do that. But the biggest, the, <laughs> I guess the question here is, so now we just oh. talk about free agency. Like you can't do anything. You know, the, the thought is you can't do anything between now and free agency. Right. Yep. Really. But, but if well, you were a team that wasn't, you know, they're looking for to, to get, well, you can trade. It's a, it's the draft, right? Like once the season's over, they can open up, right? Cause they make trades before the draft, which is before right. free agency. Correct, but they could do it now too. Right, if there were two. Yeah, so I'd like to see somebody do that. It's Great happened. Now. It's pretty rare, but you get a couple of bottom feeders. You know, there's no reason mm-hmm. you wouldn't, right? Mm-hmm. But now the dust is settled. Now they can see. Oh, okay, maybe they can change things because people are not moving the way they thought. Yeah. There's just not a lot of incentive to. You're just going to run out the season, and then you you kind of get you can get more teams in play when you're you know again it depends what you're doing if you're trading AHL players who cares right. Yeah. And that's kind of happens. But did you have any thoughts on the Tampa Rangers? That was probably the biggest trade of the day, if not the biggest surprise, was McDonough and JT Miller going to Tampa for a boatload. This, yeah, this is um, this is Tampa's time. 
<laughs> yeah, they gotta oh, do they, it. They're they making a run for it. it eh? Like, and, uh, and I agree with it. I agree. You got to do that. You got to. You got to do it because you can't. You know, you, you, this this teams that this dynasty type of uh, mentality that used to exist in the NHL is so far gone now. Like you've got to just kind of pick your pick your spots and go. Yeah, take your window and go. With it. And now, and you know what? That, that one is as big as it was, and and I think Tampa got some some really good players there to help them on their run. But the Rangers, for what they're trying to do, they got a that's a great trade. I mean, Nemesnikov is is whatever. Oh. He's, he's an okay player, <clears> but I didn't know about this. Hayek from uh, Czech, I believe, is supposed to be quite a prospect. Brett Howden's a good player. They got a first and a, and a conditional second. That's a boatload for a team trying to to rebuild. So that's a, a kind of a win win deal. I thought. No, I think so too. And you already claimed the fan base. The fan base is already set, saying, "Yeah, you know, this is let's write this off." Now they're giving them something exciting to look at, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's good. Yeah. Now good, I don't. Good, good. And now we we joke about the trade center and all the you know like just nothing happening on that day. But I bet you I didn't hear numbers. But, but I bet you it's still like one of their most watched days of the year. Like in like and this is this year I've been you know I'm starting my new job next week so tomorrow actually. But the, I wasn't doing anything so I actually had it on and it's terrible. Like it's just a there's nothing yeah. going on and they they. <laughs> And it's funny because James Duthie just makes fun of the whole show I know. all the time. Yeah, and uh, he's kind of like the David. And, yeah, it's like a David Letterman ham- shtick almost, right? Yeah, like well, he just getting their hamburgers from uh, Wendy's in there, or whatever. Harvey's. Or, Harvey's, or sorry, yeah, Harvey's, yeah, Harvey's, yeah, yeah Harvey's. Yeah, Harvey's so. <laughs> but anyway, but shall we um, go to the team of the week? Oh, I thought we already did. It. Yeah, sure, let's do it. Oh, Calgary Flames, we picked this week just for shits and giggles, oh, yeah. I guess, but. You picked it and just told me. Yeah, all right. Okay. I, I tend to do that sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. But, um, that's the way it goes. Uh, I'm one of the founders. Hey, I can do what I want. Um, but Calgary, right now, outside the playoffs, they were looking good earlier in the season. They're at 73 points, three points back of Anaheim. Anaheim has a game in hand. But they, there's also Colorado and St. Louis in between them. Not looking real good for Calgary right now. They're, they're a minus 10 team. And I was trying to figure out, okay, what uh, coming into the season, I actually thought they're a playoff team probably, or be right there on the bubble, which I guess they are. Um, mm-hmm. It's really strong defense. So you're thinking, and if Mike Smith plays, well, he's played better than I thought he would actually. And he has given them pretty good goaltending. I thought, you know, this is a team that yeah. could make some noise and they're just, meh, they're, they're just mediocre. I, yeah, I think it just goes to tell you how, the parody in this league. I mean, they had their little big run there when after the coach there lost his mind and the little uh, big run. Yeah. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit. Yeah. But I mean, they get a little excitement. They make some news or whatever yeah. and okay. Yeah. They can contend. They're beating some good in and, you know, and then they just don't have that little bit to, to put them over the edge. So, yeah. um, I would describe them as just, it's just average and nothing. No, I don't hear anything like the, there's as far as their prospects go. There's no like uh, real, guy in the stable that okay so slight technical difficulties there uh the old uh wi-fi <laughs> bit, bit dale in the ass here but we were talking calgary dale and their mm-hmm. uh, mediocre season and and you seem to think that yeah they're just there's not enough <clears throat> either in the in the organization, organization or... yeah they're just uh, just where they are and i don't see them changing okay that's but not based on stats yeah, well, if you want to talk stats, and I know you do, where, mm, you oh, do. I was waiting I, for the I, opening I'll, of the beer there, but uh, actually, I drank it because I was uh, <laughs> I couldn't wait any couldn't longer. Wait. No, they are very like uh, just. I'm trying to figure out why they're so mediocre. Because again, I think they've got a good defensive core. The goaltending's been okay, um, but you know, like their their penalty. Uh, sorry, their penalty kills 20th in the league. Their power plays 23rd. Their shooting percentage is 23rd. Their save percentage is 16th. Um, so, yeah, just mediocre across the board. Five on five, actually, their possession numbers are quite good. They're fourth in the league. Um, but if you look at their five on five save percentage, it's, it's 12th. Their shooting percentage is 23rd. So they're just... And the more I look at it, the, just I was going through all their players. Their, their top six is quite good in the forwards. Uh, Goodrow's mm-hmm. leading the charge with 73 points. Um, Monahan, I think, has Monaghan. 59. 
Um, and even for league, there's guys having good seasons, but their bottom six are just a train wreck. I think like they're just, it falls off the map quickly uh, when you get past their top four or five, really, but their top six for sure. So, um, and that's, you see a lot, especially with the parody in the league that you talked about, you need depth. That's you need up. to be able to score in your bottom two lines and, and Pittsburgh's made a, uh, you know, they've won a couple of cups with that formula and, um, and, you know, uh, looking at Tampa Bay, they're 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 doing awfully well, and and I think you could argue they've got a lot of depth, and I, I think that's that's the biggest thing that's killing the team because um, they, they I think st- you so I think you summarized it quite well. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you very much. I'm not used to oh, such compliments. <laughs> I, th- I think you just want me to move on. <laughs> yes, just move on. <laughs> I have, I have nothing else to I say, and it's you. fairly obvious that I don't know uh, too much about them, so. Um, now, do you have a rat hole for us, Dale? Of course, Mike. That's well, why I'm here. Let's get to the rat hole. So let's, um, and we'll start the intro. Let's go down, down the, the rat, rat hole, hole with, with, with Dale. Dale. Well, um, this one started from last week when I was uh, talking about trades and the trade from Quebec. And I said, um, uh, I include Duchesne and I said, oh, it's not, um, um, St- it's Steve Duchesne. It wasn't uh, Matt Duchesne, right? And you made a joke about that. So it got me on names. Okay. All right. Let's go so names. one of the most confusing things this year is this Sebastian Ajo. Yes. Which one? Well, this is it. So, um, for people that um, may not know, I mean, if you follow the NHL, you probably would. But there's two Sebastian Ajos in the NHL currently. One is Finnish, and his name is uh, Sebastian Antero Ajo, and he was born in 97. And then there is a Swedish Sebastian Johannes Ajo, who was born in 96. And he's a defenseman for the Islanders, and the first one is a forward for the Hurricanes. So they are confusing because they are um, literally they're, they're one year apart. They played uh, with the respective teams in World Juniors. To the point of confusion, I went to the Carol, I went to the Islanders page, and they referenced they had a clip to the uh, Carolina Aho on their web page. No, they did. <laughs> Because one's a so, Finn and one's a Swede, right? One's a Finn and one's a Swede. Yeah. So they've, um, so the Hurricane, <laughs> so, so I don't even know how, like, so they're trying to figure out, I was reading some blog, how to distinguish them, right? Do you call them the Finnish Aho and the Swedish Aho or the Hurricane Aho? Uh, they're just uh, a couple of Ahos. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Punchline. So anyway, they, um, they, it's a fascinating thing thing and so i started reading a little bit about um, a blog was talking about you know we talk about common names right so you know there was um there's three Derek smiths that have played in the nhl right two of them spelt the same one different and, and people can kind of get wrapped their hands especially people in north america and can wrap their heads around that a couple of interesting things i uncovered there were two greg adams on the roster for the uh 1988-89 vancouver canucks so yeah, that year, they employed that. two different gentlemen, both by the name Greg Adams. The, unfortunately, they were not on the team at the same time. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but anyway. The coach the just other, couldn't handle it. You the can't put them fast. both on the bench because <laughs> I'll get too confused. Adams, you're right. up. Fascinating stat. You know what happened November 24th, 2008? Well, that's a pretty arbitrary date. Um, uh, 2008, I don't know. Sidney Crosby got a hat trick. No, think of the rat hole. Oh, Nicholas, ba- Nicholas <laughs> Backstrom uh, sco- scored. scored on Nicholas Backstrom. Nice. Good so, one. I mean, again, people can get their, um, uh, their head around that because those are somewhat similar names. There was a Justin Falk and a Justin Falk, but spelt differently. So some they may have been confused. Um, if the Hurricanes could only get Eric Carlson from their farm system up into the NHL, that would be a good one. <laughs> yes. But they, but I, um, talking about the the Ahos, so d- did a little bit of research into this. So there's there's only seven thousand people in Finland with the surname Aho. 
There's only estimated to be like 300 families of Ajos in Sweden. So Sebastian is a common name in Sweden, but it's very, very rare in Finland. Like there's only like 971 people with the name Sebastian in Finland, right? And so you say prop- you don't like stats. No, well, this is interesting <laughs> stuff. So they talk about, you know, the guy who did his little math there, and I think there was a little bit of questioning about it. But they, you know, they, they estimated that the probability that there would be a, um, a Finnish male named Sebastian is like one in a hundred thousand, right? And then, and, and the fact that there'd be a, you know, a Swedish male with the name Sebastian would be somewhat higher. But anyway. The guy f- figured it out, and I don't really believe these numbers to be true, but it, he he, ver- he said that they were, that it would be one in 640 billion that there would be two um, players by the name Sebastian Aho. Um, make the NHL. Well, to, to even, uh, yes, to be, yeah, to be make the NHL. Well, no, actually, it wasn't even in the NHL. That was even to, that there would be those two names. Just to exist. To exist. Wow. And then the fact that they're both, you know, NHL players born one year apart, uh, you know, they compete at the highest level. Um, the numbers is, I don't think, calculable. That's staggering. To say it, is, it is staggering. But anyway, it was interesting just to talk about um, the two different, uh, uh, you know, different names and common names. But I mean, you know, the Bill Smiths and the you know, Cody Jones or whatever, those are people can wrap their heads around. But the fact that these Sebastian... Ajos are born one year apart, two different countries, and playing at the highest level of the NHL at the same time yeah. is almost incalculable. Yeah, it was, it's funny you brought that up because I came uh, when we were at the game. Jen and I were watching the uh, the Islanders and Leafs, and, and obviously Ajo is playing for the Islanders, and and I'm going, there's something about those guys. Like I said, you know, like the the that name, and I I knew there was two. And so then I checked it up, and oh yeah, the other one's playing for Carolina. So it's uh, yeah, that that's a good rat hole. I like it. Yeah. So we got to, mm. but I mean, there's no no one has established how to differentiate the two of them, right? Like as in Swedish Aho or J or whatever. Because guess what? Their their um their nicknames are the same. Seb Sebi. Sebs. Seb Sebi. Yeah. So. Seb Toot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So maybe we have to maybe. We'll have to come up and name them, but uh, yeah, hockey players aren't always the most innovative uh, mm-hmm. nickname creators. But I'm thinking there's something out there with a the last name Aho. That there's got to be something there. Yeah, it'd be a, <laughs> some creative person could come up with something. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, anything else we got for today, or is uh, we gonna mm-hmm. wrap her up there? Uh, no, I'm uh, I'm good to wrap it up. We got another um, Vincennes playing this afternoon again against the uh, Marlies, which is the Toronto Maple Leaf farm team. Yes, um, I hopefully think I know it. it. Yeah, well, I hope so too, and I hopefully that um, the uh, the Toronto Marlies will show that uh, they that the Toronto Maple Leafs have lots of good talent in the farm. Well, they have so far this year. They're an awfully good mm-hmm. AHL team, but mm-hmm. uh, I just. Uh, Real quick, I'll I'll say thank you to uh, the guys from It's a Hockey Night podcast, Mike and Brenton, because I was on on trade deadline day with them. Um, that was a lot of fun, so go check that out. You get all our in-depth commentary on the trades that were made. Um, and then uh, just, yeah, a huge thanks to, to Eric Crawford for coming oh. on the show today. Um, I think that was a, a fascinating discussion, and I uh, really appreciate him doing that. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's got any uh, questions or comments on today's show, by all means, email scuttlepuck at gmail.com, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at 13Mike31. And Dale? Uh, and I'm at Dale Horde, which uh, is my name, but I've, I haven't really got any, uh, I haven't had any uh, anyone reach out to me, so I'm kind of a little lonely. Oh, come on, send Dale some, everybody, just everybody, <laughs> yeah. fill his timeline. Um, but you got you to get out there and you got to get a little more active on the Twitters, Dale. You know, you got to well, be, that's be, probably, put yeah, your commentary so out there. I know you kind of lay low a little bit. So, you know. Yeah, I'm a creeper. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll just, 
Uh, and you can check out uh, all the good stuff on uh, scuttlepuck.com. And I'll put a link to prostockhockey.com as well on, on the website. And, and do check them out if you're buying some sticks or pants. I was really impressed, actually, with their lineup of pants. And uh, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're so, pretty yeah, nice for people to Yeah, people can figure it out. So this is pro-level stuff that have been um, sent to NHL teams. Or actually not NHL, but uh, pro teams. And been returned or deemed surplus or whatever for whatever mm-hmm. reason. So. Pro level it's the stuff. Best. Go to pro yeah. ho- prostockhockey dot com and use the promo code Scuttlepuck and you'll get a ten percent discount. So, uh, yeah, it's tough to beat. Mm-hmm. And all right, man. With, and with that, we'll wrap her up and uh, maybe we'll see you later, Dale. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, take care. Everybody Went to the party, turned around. See my baby going down. Door to door and I'll be right back. Don't make me what's in that pack. Everybody got coffee in this bit. Everybody got coffee in this Thank you.